Hello, my name is John Jackson, and I'm here to talk about telephone numbers, probably more than you ever wanted to hear about telephone numbers. I worked for 14 years at a telephone company, about half of that as a developer, and the other half is writing automated test scripts and running them too. And one thing we had to do in testing the phone system is generate phone numbers. Okay, and there's actually quite a bit more to it than, than you think under the hood. And I resurrected some code I wrote back then. I cleaned it up a bit so that it's more self-contained. Before, it used to fit into a system that I had developed. I had to rip out all the framework to fit into the system and then just make this standalone. But uh, it turned out to be, I forgot just how interesting this problem was. It's actually a lot more complicated than I remembered or than I thought. And from Doug's earlier presentation on regular expressions brought me into the 21st century on Perl regular expressions. Because uh, I haven't, the book that I had before, up to that point was probably about 10 years old. And so I discovered through his presentation the slash G token or whatever, meta, meta token, whatever. And I, so I completely rewrote the way this worked, and it's so much awesomely easier and nicer and cleaner doing that. Plus, I discovered a few interesting th things too on if you do regular expression parsing and you have errors, you would like to be able to communicate the location of that error to the user in a nice, easy, and friendly manner. Like Perl itself does, it'll say, you know, you know, parse error or whatever, syntax error at some position and give you a little caret underneath it to point it to. Well, I actually discovered, I wrote a little subroutine using the new position thing in strings and that you give it that string and, and then a message and then an offset because the offset could be based on of, of within, the, within some string you might have already taken out, you might have to back up a bit to say, okay, this is where the error really is. But anyway, that was a pretty interesting little subroutine, and it made it very, very simple to output syntax errors and show you where they are. So all that's rolled up into one. All right. Okay, so your first question might be, okay, well, what's all the fuss or the big deal about telephone numbers? Telephone numbers is a bunch of numbers, right? Well, actually, there are many, many types of numbers, and in the U.S. here, we have, like, operator, if you, obviously, you know, if you press zero, the, uh, that gets you to an operator. And, the, phone, and the, the way the phone system works is, is it, th there's a system set up so that as you dial numbers, it, it can figure out what kind of number you're dialing so that, like if you dial a seven digit number and, and you know, 10 digit numbers are allowed, how does, it, how does it know you dial a seven digit number and then immediately make that connection as opposed to waiting for maybe three, four, or five seconds? Are they gonna hit three more numbers maybe? So there's, there's a system on how they develop the numbers so that the phone system can immediately tell how that works. Of course, some number of years ago, they ran out of phone numbers, so they loosened up a lot of the rules so that it's more challenging now for the phone system to figure that out. But uh, anyway, we have operator, emergency. So obviously, if you dial the 911 pattern, how does it know after 911 that you know, you're done? Local numbers can be a seven-digit number or a 10-digit number, and how does it know when it's a 7 or a 10? And historically, before they ran out of numbers, this, the key was that an area code always had a 0 or a 1 in the second position, and this, this is called an office code. This never had a 0 or a 1 in the second position. Okay, The office code generally, again, that going back to when telephones were pretty new and, and hardware was expensive and not very advanced, an office would be like a telephone center, and then that center would handle 10,000 lines. Okay, so these three numbers told it which office actually handled these, this extension number here. And of course, area code is basically saying, okay, which state handled you know, that. So that's how that worked out. Now they ran out of numbers, so now they, they relaxed the rules about the second position, and I'm not really sure what they do now. It might have to do with if you're dialing a local area code, it probably figures it out. And as opposed to, you know, if, if I'm in Arizona, dial an Arizona area code, it's going to figure that out. And, but I don't know actually the, how, the, how all that works out now. And you have what's called toll local. You can dial 1411 for information. Uh, long distance, of course, is, has a one in front of a 10-digit number. Toll-free, it's the same exact format, but somehow it knows this is toll-free and this one is not. And then you have pay, which is the same format. Somehow it knows this is a pay number and this is not. And the difference, is, of course, is the secret is, is these two digits here. Zero, zero meant, remember, zero always, in this position, always meant it was an area code. And so these two zeros here plus the eight 
because you can actually have 811 or no 822 833 844 also are toll free numbers so if it matches that pattern then it's toll free I'm not sure if there are more complicated patterns than 900s operator assisted you can put a zero instead in front instead of a one and then you actually get the operator on the line and they can help you make further connections if you need it uh, you have alternate carriers remember way back when that commercials on MCI and Sprint and all that and you can go through depending upon where you're calling like if you're calling to the East Coast maybe you want to use one carrier if you're calling to Canada might different maybe a different carrier Mexico a different carrier because you can get maybe a better rate using those different carriers so if you entered in a pattern like this first and then your number like the East Coast maybe you know this and then your East Coast number then you would get that better better rate I think we had like two or three different carriers or even if possibly if uh, since we made phone systems we we could actually you could actually send uh, phone calls over your network okay so your private network and so if you have an office on the East Coast office on the West Coast hey why not just send them through your private network for free instead so you could the phone system could decode this this carrier number and say okay these numbers need to go through this private network as opposed to going through the regular network and international of course you put something like zero one in front and then you have a country code and then you and then this is you're going to be your country specific telephone number or whatever plan they have and so a phone system handles different types of numbers differently uh, for instance from a user point of view is do you want the janitor to be able to make unlimited uh, long distance calls you know and so if if somebody has an extension number each extension number like the phone on your desk has an extension number might or might not be allowed to make any any type of these calls okay and again which carrier should carry a particular long distance call because the phone system could even decode the area code and make those kinds of decisions too as to okay which carrier should we use based on the area code and what is the estimated running cost of the call one feature of the system we had was that when you made a long distance call based on the carrier rate that it used when it made the call it actually put on display this is the estimated current cost of the call you know 45 cents now 50 cents now 60 cents and so you get an idea of how much this call is costing you in the long run okay any any questions okay Uh, yeah, uh, correct. Uh, correct. Yes, because zero means operator, our operator assisted, or international. One always means toll things. So the area codes always start with two to nine, and office codes always start with two to nine. So they asked that very good question. That's another. Oh, the question was I should need to remember to repeat this: is do area codes ever start with a zero or a one? And the answer is no, in the United States anyway. Any question? It, it, it's a completely new ball game. They can do whatever they want. In fact, I'm going I'm to compare a little bit of Mexico, the United Kingdom, and the U.S. Okay, and so that'll hopefully answer. Oh, again, the question was: Do other countries have like seven-digit numbers too? And the answer is they can do whatever they want. It it could depend on the size of the country. If you have a small, if you only have 50 million people, you don't have to have 10-digit numbers. If you've got a billion people like China, they got to probably have 15 digit numbers, you know, so it all depends on what their needs are going to be. Okay. So each country, as I said, has its own numbering plan and even hyphenation rules. In the USA, we tend to put, you know, 3 di 3 dash, 3 dash, 3 for 10, 7 and 10 digit numbers. Some countries, I noticed, like UK, it seems like our phone system handled different we sold it in different countries so that's one reason why these number codes were programmable into the system and for some reason they just didn't have dashes when they printed reports with their phone numbers they just had one big long phone number and Mexico two perhaps I, I don't remember exactly but to compare so uh, a local to a local number in the United States is in and then six X's where an in is two to nine X's then is any digit in the UK they actually have three types of local numbers uh, this one is almost the same as this, only 999 is, is the one thing that's not allowed, okay. And every, but everything else is exactly the same. And, and these, I don't remember now why these were local. They might have been, emerg uh, not emergency, but info or I don't know, who knows. what. I don't remember now exactly why these were special numbers, but these were considered to be local numbers. The Mexico, 
is also very similar. It has its seven digits too, just like the United States, only n can be one through nine instead of two through nine. Okay. And again, to reiterate, if I didn't make this clear, the reason why you have to send the right numbers into the phone system when you're testing it is because you want to make sure the phone system responds to that number correctly, whether it should be disallowed, you know, whether it charges, it shows the rates at the right, you know, the cost at the right rate and, and things like that. Okay, any questions here? Am I talking too fast? I tend to kind of buzz along. Okay, so here's the USA number plan at least about maybe 10 years ago or 15 years ago, something like that. It, it might, it's probably changed since then a little bit. But international calls always start with a 01 or a 011. Okay, and, and this other syntax I'll explain later. This actually is written in the syntax that this Perl program parses now. So uh, I'll define the symbol I to being that. We'll have the symbol N means any digit between 2 and 9, our operator, toll number, any digit. Z was just the opposite of N, was, N was 2 through 9, so Z was everything else. Q was, again, your, I think was stood for quality of service, but basically it was your alternate carrier codes. If it started with 100 and two, two digits, 101, four digits, or 10, and then N, and then two more digits. And then S was for supervisor, a supervised call or supervisory call, which usually involved like an operator or something like that or tolls or things like that. So any number that starts with an I pattern, an R pattern, or a T pattern then is a supervisory call. And then now we get to the meteor pattern. So emergency, here's the pattern, 911, that's it. <coughs> okay, that's, it's always that. A toll-free number is a toll digit followed by an 8, followed by 0 through and 2 through 8. The equal sign here meant the same digit again, so 800 or 822, 833, 844, and then followed by a 7-digit number. International starts with an I, and then it's just a bunch of stuff. A local call could start with, the first three numbers could start with anything except for what's in, in this list here. Okay, so this carrot here means like, it's like Pearl. I stole a lot of this from Pearl, of course. So Pearl means not, or this carrot means not any of those numbers. Long distance, it's not any of those three followed by your seven digits. A toll local is a toll digit followed by, you know, one of these and then one one. And then operator starts with an R symbol and then a long distance number and then pay whole digit, a 900, and then your seven digits. Okay. Any questions there? Yes. Why is the one not included on toll-free? Toll-free, uh, here we go. I don't know. That's just the way the rule is. I, probably because it violates something else. It might be because, uh, let's see, like eight. Oh, eight because of these. Eight, one, one. So they don't want anything to look like, they don't want, this to ever look like, because you could have, like, if you drop the toll, if you drop the T digit, you can dial like 811 and then something, and that might even be valid for, for whatever reason, but 811 would look like this. Anything, remember, remember 11 here or a toll local, 11 here. So anything, any, any digits, any digit stream where the second and third digit was a 11 meant something special. So that's why it's disallowed here. Okay. And nine, I don't know why nine is, is disallowed too, unless that's just an error on my part, but I think nine is disallowed. So it probably, they might've done that just maybe for expansion. So maybe like eight, nine, nine, nine or something might be, <laughs> you might, might allow more, more openness into the numbering scheme. Okay. Oh, I didn't repeat the question again too. Why is one not in this toll free pattern? Yeah, and then in fact, the same reason, it's, it's none of these other things can start with, can have the second and third digit be 1-1, one, one. okay? Otherwise, it's going to misinterpret it as this or that. So there's actually lots and lots and lots of holes in the numbering plan. Because of things like this, you know, that, that, that sucks up a lot. This sucks up a lot of your number space. Because if you have 10-digit numbers, you've just disallowed seven digits <laughs> Behind that, 911. So, 
Okay. Oh, and. Trade off seems valid. Though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And oh, and then for testing purposes too, then I also had in my patterns what's called allowed and denied. So if you want to test the phone system and say, I just want to try all the different allowed numbers to make sure the phone system lets me do it, and I want to try all the denied numbers to make sure the phone system doesn't let me do it, then you can just make those patterns here. Okay. Okay, so here's the syntax for this program. So any character is zero through nine, star and pound. Oh, I forgot to put dash in there, sorry, is a uh, literal character. Dash obviously doesn't mean anything, it's just carried over as text. Star and pound, of course, you can dial them on your, your phone, so they're allowed in the string here. Uh, for instance, if you're making a call in your phone system that maybe, uh, uh, or if you wanted to call, like if they wanted to call our voicemail system, it might say enter in your account number or something followed by a pound key, so then that, this is then allowed this test system to, to allow those characters to without making them special cases. So anything between square brackets, any digit between the square brackets is just pick one of those digits at random. If you stick a caret in front of that, then that means just invert that set. So this set here is the same as three through six, or, you know, so you can just express it however is most convenient to you. A plus in front means when I, when I uh, expand this number or render this number, I don't want just one, one number. I want, I want eight numbers. I want all eight numbers. So I want a list of eight numbers. This will return a list of one number. This will return a list of eight numbers. Okay. And that's if you want to just try all the, all the numbers in the, in the pattern. Equal means whatever the last digit was, just repeat it to be the same digit. So I've used that for toll-free numbers. So any of these digits followed by the same thing again. And then just for uh, consistency, although I don't, well, I guess, yeah, that makes two for testing because you want to make sure that if it isn't an, a toll-free pattern that it would not recognize it. So bang here meant pick some different character or some different digit from the last digit and insert that in that position. The angle brackets means pick a random code. And by code, I meant like area code, office code, extension code. I'm allowing up to five digits, but you can have one, two, three, four, or five digits. But if you, whatever, whatever this first one is, though, they all have to be the same. So if this first number is three digits, then all the numbers in here have to be three digits. And you can have comma separated lists of numbers, too. And the same thing here, caret inverts the set. So that means 200 through 999. Plus means in, itemize the set again. So you're going to get 200 numbers, a list of 200 numbers if you execute that pattern. And symbols, so you can define any symbols, any, as many symbols as you want in your patterns. Uh, if it's a single character by itself, letter by itself is a symbol. Otherwise, if you have multi-character symbols, just put braces around them and it'll, it'll figure that out. This probably isn't really true, is it? Because I don't want you to start with a zero, but it'd probably work anyway, though. And let's see, in parentheses is a random pattern. Oh, when I said that, when I talked about this being recursive patterns, I meant to say there's nothing in, in phone numbers themselves that are recursive. It's just, it's just numbers. However, it was convenient to write this parser in a, as a recursive parser so that you could have sub-patterns in your patterns, and the sub-pattern is, is parsed recursively as though it's just were a pattern on its own. And so parentheses opens that up. So... Uh, this will just pick a random, one of those patterns at random and return that in the list. Again, the plus will itemize it, so you want all three patterns, so a list of all three of those patterns. And then you can repeat a pattern a fixed number of times or from this many to this many times. So this would return, this pattern here is going to return three times four numbers, okay? So you get three, you'll have, you'll have 800 with 1x, 2x, 3x, and then you'll have no, I'm sorry, this is going to return one number. This is because it's a fixed number. So you're going to have three X's here and four X's there. Okay. This will return six numbers. You'll have one 800 with one X and then two, and then another one with two X's, and then the last one will be with six X's. Okay, and you might have this pattern again for testing to make sure that the phone system times out waiting for that last seventh digit. Okay. You want to make sure that it doesn't actually route, somehow make a valid call when you haven't entered all the numbers in. 
So a lot of these patterns don't make sense for real use, but they do make sense in, in the realm of testing for error testing. Okay. I think that's actually the end of my... Uh, PowerPoint, so I'm going to get into what we all love to see is some code. So, first of all, I thought, let's see, I think I've got a command window open here. There we go. So, let me, let me start over again. Just making sure that my last changes didn't actually not compile. Okay, so I wrote a little front end. Maybe I should go over the front end real quick. That just makes it easy to call to call my uh, my parser here. So actually, here's here's an example of Mexico patterns. Okay, emergency. Let's see, like a local number. Well, no, you've already seen local numbers. Toll free is zero one followed by eight hundred. I guess they did use a dash there. Here's some UK numbers. And the local calls, well, we saw that already. Uh, toll free, started with 0500 or 0800. And of course, the US. And I put in uh, some test patterns here just to demonstrate the different patterns in use. So, what this front end thing does is if I give it just a letter, that means, ex that means uh, render this, the pattern underneath that, that symbol. If I say uh, equal symbol, then that means. Uh, de declare one of these predefined symbols. If I say question mark, it'll dump all the symbols. And then if I say equal or uh, oh, symbol followed by a number, it'll generate that number of, of uh, numbers, that count of numbers. Okay. So let's start with a pattern, like say, uh, I don't know. B equals five. So if I say B, so I get back one number, that's five, okay. If I say uh, like B equals, and then random zero through nine, and of course you execute, you evaluate B and you get some random number. So I do it again, you get in different numbers. Now one thing you can do is uh, you can, if you want to, if you want to make one number more more common, you can actually put the same number in more than once, and then it'll just it'll just weight that number down by by that much. So most of these are going to be zeros, but I'm still getting a few others. So. Okay, I put in a pattern here to test all of the patterns to give you a sample. So. All these symbols here, I put a number in front of to, so I can order them on the dump. That way, it'll make more sense if we follow them. So I need to point to this, don't I, when I, uh, OK. So this symbol here, let's just test literal, literal. So I've created a symbol called literal, and I just put all the literals in there. And then I evaluate that, and I get one number, OK. So here it gives me a random number. This will give me a random digit mostly zeros. This says, OK, 4 through 5 and 9, because it has a caret in front, so it gave me a 5. This is I want to itemize 0, 1, 3, 4, 6, 7, 9. And so I did get, oh, I didn't reset my counter, did I? So I got seven, seven numbers here. OK, uh, let's see. Okay, same thing here, only this is the, the uh, invert. So I want four, five, or six, gonna itemize four, five, or I'm sorry, a nine. Repeat patterns. Any questions so far? Yeah, um, oh. just wherever the three and six is, our syntax would have a comma in between that. Uh, no, the other ones don't. This one, I didn't need commas because it's, because you only, you only allowed single digits in here. They're all single digits. Okay. So it's not, just yeah. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, the interpret is this. Everything in here is a single digit, so, so you don't need a comma to separate anything out. So this means 0 to 3, 6 to 8. Now, that's not true for the other list, because these can be 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 
digits long, so you need the commas to separate them there. Plus, it's a, bit, a lot more readable that way, too. Okay, so this one is, okay, repeat same, so it's going to pick some random digit, then the same thing twice, and then some other digit, and then that other digit again. Okay, so I get one, 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 two, two. So one was the one I chose randomly, repeat that twice, then some other one it chose randomly, repeat that again. And this is just the opposite. So some random digit, different, different, same, different. So eight, zero is not eight, four is not zero, four is the same as four, zero is not four. So. Okay, random code, just, uh, just make things simple. I kept them one digit codes. So it's gonna pick one of those randomly. Here's uh, two digit codes. It's gonna pick from one, one from zero to 22 or 33, and in this case it picked zero four. Uh, let's see, oh, the plus in front of course itemizes, so now we get every one of those numbers in this list is in here. Here are these five digit numbers, and to keep it go simple is the only numbers that are, this is an invert here plus itemize, and the only numbers in here are actually these five numbers here, 8,000 through 8,004. Everything else is disallowed. Now symbols, okay. So I just put star, here's the pattern, star, little x, star, and then this symbol here, which is a random number. So star, what's little x? Why is there a pound sign there? Do I have a, uh, oh, x. Okay, x is defined down here. Okay, so x, uh, is the pound sign. So it's going to be star, pound, star, and then a random number, which is just a seven here. And then here's again symbols using uh, random pattern. So it's going to be either this pattern or this with a symbol in it and that symbol there or, and there's, so I, I never put a number in front of each pattern. So there's one, two, three, four, and then five. So it's going to pick one of these patterns at random and it picked uh, pattern number two, this is just one literal, so that must have picked the dash. No, I'm sorry, the dash is right here, so then it picked a zero. So the oh, I'm sorry, I'm in the so right the pattern. The was from above, oh, one <coughs> literal. Yeah, literal. Oh, right, 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 right. That's, and that was every one of the literals. So here's the two, here's the dash, and then here's every one of the literals that was in that symbol. Here is a also random pattern with an itemized. Oh, and I put an empty pattern in front. So it actually returns four values. You got one, two, and then nothing. And then one, two, three, one, two, four, and one, two, five. Okay, and then another random pattern with itemized. We're going to get one entry for each of these numbers in this list. It's the same list, I think, as before. So we have the five different patterns here. And then here are some examples of repeat. So I'm going to have five zeros. We're going to have two to four of anything in the range of one to three. And then three of these, 44 or 45, and then two of one of these. And you can see here we get three, three numbers. And that's because of this right here, two, three, and four, right? So we're going to get three numbers, so we get five zeros, then we get, here we got two threes, and we got a three, one, and a two that are all in here, and then we got a two, two, and a three, and a three all from here. And then the fours, we get a three, four, fours, and four, five, so here's four, 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 five, four, five, four, five, four, five, and four, 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 five, four, four, and then of course two of selections from that list there. Okay. So if we were to load the USA, and I typed in toll free, then I get, whoops. I wish I didn't double check my patterns here. Okay. I think I do some run I had to do some real-time debugging last time too. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. So I must have an error in my 
So I just told free, right? So x, how can x be infinite loop? Where are my symbols? See if that one works. See if what? I'm sorry. See if one works. Okay, yeah. <laughs> Unless I broke the code. Yeah. <sighs> I must have broken something. Okay, so let's see. Let's see, let's just try making a pattern up. So equals zero. Oh, I want to put a plus in front of that. Say hundred. Okay. So will this work? Okay. So I got to figure out. But anyway, now if I also want, say, for testing purposes, maybe I want to make. You know, this is kind of unfun because it won't show you one of the features. Let me try defining x to be zero through nine. Hopefully this won't. Oh well. <laughs> Why would it? That's probably one of the last things I did was I put in, I decided at the last minute, I had to put in an infinite loop detector because if you have a symbol, you know, eventually at some point call itself then there's no way for this thing to stop, so I didn't want it to go on forever. So obviously I didn't test that as carefully as I should have. I did test it, but that's what I'm saying is that I must have, I must have, uh, <laughs> oh, you know what, it, yeah, you know what it is, is that, yeah, I, when I, when I when you use a symbol, I say, okay, I've seen this symbol used, but it doesn't clean it up afterwards. So if you use it twice, it's going to say it's infinite. And it's supposed to only be when you're going down in recursion and come back up again, it should empty it out again. So, yeah, I screwed that up. I didn't make that a counter or something and not a... Uh... Oh, actually, maybe I can fix it like that real fast. Let's make it plus equal one. And then if it's greater than zero... If I'll just say greater than one, right? Let's see if that fixes it. Nope, it didn't fix it. <laughs> Okay, anyway, well, okay, we won't, what's that? Um, don't you want to use QT or dash QT? Or am I showing like uh, that was a, That's a string, or string GT. That's a string comparison, right? Yeah, yeah, this is a numeric comparison. So it, the problem is it's saying, I, I guess... Oh, yeah, let's do that since I don't actually have infinitely defined. Okay, I'll fix this before I upload, before I upload it, okay. There we go, okay. So now you can say one other thing I can show you is that, is that one thing that made this program a little more complicated too is, is that I didn't want to just render each of those symbols once because then you would get if I did this say toll free say I wanted say a hundred of them 
Okay, if, if you render, render the n and the x once, you'd have the same number over and over again with only the only difference being the 800 part. Okay, so actually go through the, the trouble to reevaluate it every single time, every number, every single time, so that you get a much more random looking number. For testing purposes, it probably doesn't really matter that much, but it just looks a lot nicer when you got more random looking numbers. So yes, that yes, this will not this will not prevent duplicates. So uh, if in your testing, I, I suppose I could uh, that's an idea. I could put them in a hash or something and just pull out duplicates. So that could be a feature enhancement. But anyway, so okay, there we go. Right. Yeah, or, or, yeah. Yeah. Actually, I, it sort of, sort of already does that because this pattern, as you saw, only produces eight numbers, okay? And so I, I do keep calling it until I get over my limit, and then I pair off the extra ones. And so that could do it, too. Now, the only problem you could have, though, is if, is if your pattern doesn't produce a thousand unique numbers, <laughs> you know, then... Uh, then you go into an infinite loop trying to produce a thousand unique numbers from a pattern that cannot produce a thousand unique numbers. So that's another, another potential problem with that. So it might be, might be best left for the user to do their own uh, a duplicate re, uh, uh, removal. Do you use this for anything in practice now? Or is not now, no, no. no I, just want, I just want to come up with a presentation for, for the class here or for the group here. And I thought this would be pretty simple. I said, hey, I can just borrow this. I already wrote this. Turned out I'd spent about two more weeks <laughs> rewriting it and relearning a lot of stuff. It's like, wow, it was a lot more complicated than I thought. But anyway, so now we can go through some code. Yeah. But you know, at some point I thought here, here, we can probably use it here. We might have some, because I'm automated tested, he, testing here now with Ticketmaster. So at some point, I'm sure I'll have to inject telephone numbers into the system, so this could be handy for generating numbers. Oh, you know what? I also realized that without too much more work, we can use it to generate credit card numbers, bank account numbers, things like that. With credit card numbers, the one hitch you have is there's a checksum on it. So I just have to add a feature to be able to some kind of syntax to say, okay, I want you to put a checksum on this number and maybe what kind of checksum or whatever kind of thing. So that shouldn't be too hard to put in there, but uh, I, could, I could enhance it to do stuff like that. I have to find a better name than the phone number generator, but. So is the point of this is just to produce the phone numbers? It's not actually mm -hmm. to, to dial a number? Well, no, I use these back, back where I worked before. Then this is how I would get a bunch of random numbers mm -hmm. then, because the whole, the whole automated system that I wrote was in Perl. So then I could actually talk to the phone system and say, okay, make this call, and then, I, then I could, the program then could monitor, one thing it could monitor was the, uh, the reports coming out of the phone system. So you make a long distance call, a report comes out of the phone system that says, this extension made this long distance call at this time, blah, 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 so that I could verify that that report matched up what I did. Or if I dial the emergency number, the report, the report saying, this extension dial the emergency number, blah, 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 and then it would also signal various emergency stations that that number was dialed. Or if it's disallowed, I could verify that the number was disallowed. Like the phone, you get a ring back, you get like an error tone coming back on the phone. I could monitor that, say, okay, phone received error tone. Okay, the number was disallowed because this extension was not allowed to dial 900 numbers. You know, and then also, a nice feature of this too is for the, the country, based on the country, you're gonna define a whole different set of, of you might have the same symbols like toll free, local long distance, but you have different patterns. But there are some kinds of types of calls that exist, say, in the U.S. that don't exist in, say, Mexico or the U.K. Like, I think pay at the time didn't have, didn't have that in Mexico. So in your, in your test, you could have a loop that says, okay, and one, one feature I put in here is give me a list of all the symbols that you have defined. And then, then in your test, you could say, okay, is the... Uh, is the toll free or is the pay symbol defined? If it is, then call the subroutine to test the pay feature. If it's not defined, then obviously you can't run that test, so you just skip it. Okay, so that makes your test then less sensitive to the country you're actually 
running in because the phone system itself will behave the same way based on this type of number, but the type of number can change and whether, the, whether that type of number even exists can change too. Okay. I think, uh, well, most of the testing I did, like, like any place, we had, you know, we had like four and a half testers to about 50 engineers, so we never caught up. But most of the testing I did, I focused on was the internal instrument, okay, it was, it was like, it's like the Cisco phone, it's a, uh, it's an, it was an IP phone. So I could actually, I actually wrote Perl to simulate the phone itself, it just, all I had to do was log into the phone system, the only, the only hard part was every, every five seconds it had to send a keep alive message to the phone system that it was still plugged in. Other than that, it's just, it's just protocol going back and forth. So the phone system didn't know the difference between the Perl program and a real phone. In fact, I could even, well, I could even then capture the audio, which was on the controls on TCP, the audio is on UDP. So then I could actually send messages. I generate messages in Perl that's, that I could take a text string, I could encode it into using either frequency modulation or amplitude modulation, I could send those packet, UDP packets down into the, uh, into the voice, uh, the voice uh, answering system. It can record this message and I could call in again and play it back and then decode that I put in there and get the same string back that I put in so I could verify that, that it all worked. That's all in Perl too. So I've got tons of things I could use for these demonstrations here. And uh, anyway, so anyway, does that answer your question? I didn't repeat your question again, so. So what was your question again? Oh, my question was whether you ever had to accommodate for gaining an outside line and then pausing before that. Okay, did I ever have to accommodate for gaining an outside line, pausing for dial tone and stuff like that? I think I never got to that. Now I could, on the instrument itself, I could detect that the phone system sent the phone instrument a dial tone command. Okay, but when it came to actually, okay, am I, getting, am I receiving an actual <sighs> telco office dial tone I don't think I ever got, got to that. All the, focus, all the testing I was focused on was just all the internal intercom stuff and making outgoing calls and making, and I could make incoming calls too and verify they're going through, but no, the, I think that's, that specifically, I think the answer is no, I didn't listen for an actual central office dial tone. Okay, question, yes? No, no, they're not. No, that could be duplicates. So, like we were talking about earlier, is that I could probably put something in, but you have to worry about then what if a pattern only produces 10 numbers? You'll never get the 100 duplicate, I mean, 100 unique numbers. So, that would be, yeah, I'd probably have to make, maybe, maybe, maybe I could make another function that says, okay, take this list and make it unique, and then you'll just get what you get. Something like that. I don't know. Yeah, or yeah, maybe like a retry limit. Yeah, just say, okay, I'll try 10 times, and if I... Or you use a warning filter, so... Or you do the hash thing where you put the number in the key, and then you don't finish until you've got the number or keys you need. So yeah. Unless the phone still is, and then you can just compare it to the original number and just say, I couldn't generate it now, so... Yeah. Generate. Actually, you know, I think I could do that because... Each pattern returns a unique, no, I mean, a, sp a specific number of, p of numbers, each pattern. So I could get that back, and then if, you, if I call it, and I could try each one of the numbers that returns, and if it's, oh, I mean, that's right, it, it could still, no, nah, I don't think that'll work either. Anyway, that's another problem to solve, okay. And we still have, what, how many, about 10 minutes. So let's go into some code. I've got all my documentation down here at the bottom. So you can read all that. You know what, I, I use Perl to pod, I mean use pod to HTML. I used to know how to render it CPAN style, but I could not for the life of me remember how to do that because it looks so much nicer. But I've got that, I got, it's pretty well documented. Uh, so but if you go to the top, so what I do is when I parse it, 
I, I come up with, there's, I have seven different operations. So concat is the operation of, that's when you just have a bunch of symbols next to each other. You're going to concatenate them together. And itemize, again, is that operation was if you had some kind of brackets or brace or parentheses with the plus in front. That means the value of that token or that operator will be then the list of all the values to pick from or that are, that are in the pattern. Uh, literal just means it's going to mean this, this character is either a 0, 1, or 2, or a star, or whatever. Random means it's going to pick from a random list. Repeat same is just an equal operator, repeat other, bang operator, and then a symbol just means substitute the symbol for the, its value. And I keep uh, three variables in here. I keep a list of the compiled symbols. As you define a symbol, I go ahead and compile it on the spot, which means convert it into this data structure that says what it is and what to do with it. I keep the uncompiled so that I have a function or method that says, give me back the symbols that are defined, so that again the test can say, OK, what symbols are defined so that I know what I can and what I cannot test. And I just have it return all the original input in case they wanted to say, in their log file, say, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to process this toll-free symbol. Here's a pattern that's it's registered underneath it and goes ahead and does its tests. This was the one I added to try to re remove the uh, infinite loop, and then I messed that all up, apparently. <laughs> so i got to work on that one. So I have a method for declaring. Declaring says you pass in a, uh, a hash table that has all your symbols in it. It's going to clear out the existing table and then repopulate it with the new symbols and, and it repopulates it by calling define, which is right below here. So this define will either define a new symbol or replace an existing symbol. So then for each symbol value pair, if the pattern is not defined, I'm just going to undefine the symbol from the table. The pattern is defined. Then I discovered here, I, do, I set the position to zero because I think when you try to use position to say print out a syntax error message or whatever, and if you haven't previously defined it, it's undef and you get those little warnings. I've, I've, I've recently learned to turn on warnings, and so now I've discovered a whole new bunch of things that I got to do right. <laughs> That's right. So, and so I call, I have a parse method here then, and for the, for the recursion part, I pass in the value zero means that this is the first level I'm going to call it parse, and then when parse calls itself, it just keeps incrementing that number so it knows whether it's recursing or not. I think, oh, okay, we'll get into that. I'm going to have to go fast because we don't have much time left here. So I pass in a reference to this node here, just going to, just going to hold whatever gets compiled, it re gets returned back, and then I pass in a reference to the pattern. You probably I assume you can't pass in the pattern itself because you're going to make a new copy of it and that's going to not work with your position, your position on your string. So I pass in a reference to it. And then I had it return either null or undef if, if it's successful or return an error message if it's not successful. So if it's not successful, then I just go ahead and then I'm done and return the error message. Otherwise, I add the, the pattern to the uncompiled symbols or add, the, add that compiled node to the list of compiled symbols. And then here's the parse routine. Uh, let's see. So while I haven't reached the end of the pattern, I'm going to check to see, OK, is the next symbol, here, I'll do it this way, is the next symbol the uh, one of these literals? OK. Put that down a little more. And I look for only one. When I first did this, I thought it'd be nice. I might as well just put a plus here, because if there's a whole bunch of them together, I can just stick it underneath that literal command, and it works. But that doesn't work with the repeat operator later on, because it repeats the entire string, rather than just logically you want just what's to the left of the repeat operator. So if you have one, two, three, repeat three times. You want to repeat only the three three times. You want to repeat the one, two, three three times. So, so, I, actually have to pro so I actually process them one at a time. And then, so is it the repeat saying, so if, if it's literal, then I just go ahead and put it, say the operation is literal, and then put the value in there. If it's the repeat same, just put the operation there. If you repeat other, just put the operation in there. If it's a random digit pattern, if it's between the braces, 
then I pull out the plus and the caret here, and then anything else that's not a uh, bracket. So I keep those flags, I call these flags the plus and the caret, and then the sub pattern I put in here. The rest of this is I call a sub pattern because then if I had a syntax error, I needed, I needed to know what I originally, I needed to know what this was, I think, in order to calculate the correct position of the syntax error. Or no, that's this right here. I keep the original that, of the entire thing that I, that I grabbed. So I needed to keep this entire thing I grabbed because when you're done, when this matches, your position is here, but I need to back up some amount when I point to, it, to where the syntax error is. So this keeps the original pattern so that I can know how to back up. And then I just accumulate my digits here. Let's see. So again, I set position to zero. Oh, because this is a new string now. I got to set position to zero, otherwise I'll get those undef errors. And then for each digit, this is what random digit was it again? Yeah, random digit. So for each digit in the sub pattern, we're going to pull it out. And uh, if it's a digit dash digit, then I process that here. If it's a single digit, we process that here. If it's not either one of those, it's a syntax error. So I return the original string that got parsed in, or passed in, which the position now is right, again, is right here, right? I pass in a message, not a numeric digit, and then I need to tell it how much to back up, which is the length of my sub-pattern minus the position, and you can't see all that. Let's see. It's the length of this sub pattern, which, which the sub pattern even was the digits, right? Minus the position that I'm in there, because that, that also backs me up plus one, there's a little correction, and then you negate that, so that's how much to back up. <laughs> okay, you understand that? So, so your position is here on the original one, the syntax error was here, I had to back up the length of this string here minus where I am in that string, so that's going to back it up this much here. Okay. And then we'll have to go even faster now. Uh, let's see. If, if it had the inverse flag in it, then I'm gonna, then I'm just going to whatever digits are in there. I'm going to make a new string that has them not in there. <laughs> okay. One thing you lose in this. Remember, in, in original random digits, you could you could have the same digit more than more than once. So say five zeros, six zeros. Well, when you invert it, it can't know. Well, does he want like five threes or something? So it's just going to have one of each of the opposite digits in it, not some multiple count of them. And syntax error if the result has no digits at all. And then we go ahead and make our operator here. So the operation then is either going to be itemize if, it's a plus, if a plus is in the flags, or if it's going to be random. And then uh, then I have to create a list that has each of the digits in it. So I split the digits and then make a list of these operator, literal operators, and then put each digit into its own little structure there. So that way, if you have zero, if you have random zero to nine, you're going you're gonna to have ten of these. And then if it's random, it'll pick one of those ten. If it's itemized, it's going to run through all of them. Okay. And I probably should just. Uh, we probably want to get to the rendering engine a little bit too, so I'm probably just going to skip the rest of this. Oh, one comment here when I did the uh, codes, because you can have five digit codes, which is what, 10 or 99,000 or 100,000 numbers, actually made a, bit, made a bit list. So if you had a three digit code, I made a bit list that could hold 1,000 bits, and then I filled that bit list up with the numbers you specified. If you said inverse, then there was a nice, it was very easy in Perl to say uh, invert the, the bit list. So here it is, you just put bit list equals tilde bit list. <laughs> and then, then I got the inverse, and then I just converted the bit list back into a list of three digit number, or three or four or five or one or two digit numbers again. Okay. And then, oh, the random pattern, too, that's true. That's the one where the recursion comes in, so we should look for that. So if it starts with a left parent, I pull off the plus if it's, if it's present. 
Then I go into an apparent infinite loop. Okay. So here you're going to parse. You're going to call the rec par uh, parse recursively. And then when it comes back, you're going to say, if there's a comma, then we do our next one. So go back up here. If it's a right parent, then obviously we're done. We're, we do the last. Otherwise, we've got a syntax error. Okay, and the one thing to make that work, which is why I had to know what level I was in in recursion, is that at the very bottom of this loop, if nothing matched, then we have to look to see, okay, if we're in level zero, if we're not in level zero, then just we're done, exit. It'll return then up to the next level of recursion, which then, like, like the comma, like the codes would be zero, 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 comma, zero, zero, one. The comma doesn't parse anywhere in that main parser, so it's going to just, because we're, in, we're one level down in recursion, it'll just return back up to the previous level. The previous level is what's going to match on that comma. Okay. However, if we are at level zero, then that means we actually have a syntax error. We don't know what to do with this thing, so then you're going to report the syntax error. Okay. And uh, let's see, get numbers. This now is going to go ahead and render. So the way I set this up is you pass in a token. I figured it doesn't really, or a symbol, it doesn't really make sense to pass in a pattern. It says, give me a number of these patterns. Because if you have a generic test, it's going to say, I want the toll-free patterns. I don't want, you know, 1-800, blah, blah, blah. So you're always going to start by passing in a symbol. So all your symbols need to be predefined. So I start with a symbol and say, OK, we'll make sure that the symbol is defined. If it is, then this was, of course, maintaining my recur or my infinite loop list, which isn't working. But I added that symbol to it, since obviously I'm using that symbol. And then we go into a loop that uh, this loop, then, if you, if you supplied a count, if you don't supply a count, so the count is, is undef. Let me go back to the top real quick, sorry. To this get numbers routine, you pass in a pattern to or a reference to a list to receive the numbers. You're going to pass in your symbol and then a count. If count is undef, that means just return the number of numbers that this pattern naturally produces. Otherwise, if you give an actual count, then it will keep calling that pattern over and over again, rendering that pattern as many times as it takes to produce that many numbers. So I have a do loop because we're always going to call it once. Then I call render once. And if I get it back an error message, of course, you return. If I get back a list of zero entries, that means for some reason that pattern doesn't produce any numbers. So if they asked me for a count, <coughs> a count, sorry, obviously you're going to spin an infinite loop if you want 100 numbers and this pattern doesn't return any numbers. You're going to be asking that for a long time. So I return another error if zero numbers come back from that pattern. Otherwise, I push those new num that list of numbers into my overall collection list. And then I continue until either, well, until I re I've reached the uh, required count, or if they didn't specify a count at all, then I'm just done. I exit out of there, too. And then if they did require a count, then I trim off any, any numbers that are beyond that count. OK. Now here's the entry point to render which there's actually two renders. There's an upper, there's the upper level render is what's going to do the repeat count. So if I have repeat from two to five, okay, I get, I get that out of here. And if I have, say, the pattern one and then x and then followed by repeat two through five, I want one x, x, and then one, and then the second number is going to be one x, 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 and then the third one's going to be one x, 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 x. So I need to start with the same list, the one, and then I'm going to apply that pattern to it twice, and then three times, and then four times, and then five times to get the four numbers back. So this top-level render routine is what's just doing that. It just starts with the original pattern. Here, I'll put this up here. Starts with the original list, which is in temp list. It's going to call render two and then uh, pass in the operation it's supposed to be doing, which is that, like the x, and then it's going to call it that many times, the first two times, and then it's going to push that results into my return list. Then it's going to go back and say, okay, now we're going to do it three times. We reset my original list, 
then I call render two three times and then whatever it, it finishes up with gets pushed into my return list and then you do the same thing for four times and the same thing for five times. Okay, any questions there? That was a little, I had to scratch my head a little bit too to figure that one out because the first time it didn't, didn't work right. It didn't return a bunch of different numbers like I expected it to. And then finally the render two is what actually takes the operation and, and and returns an actual number. So if it's if it's concat, then for each item in the list, remember the concat operator has a list of then patterns to execute. So for each pattern to execute, it's going to call the top level render again and then push the results into its return list. If it's itemized, itemized actually is very similar to the repeat. Because the repeat member, okay, itemized, you're going to have, say, three or four patterns in a list. Well, a repeat two through five is really a repeat with four items, four patterns in a list. Only instead of explicitly having a list of four patterns, it's going to, uh, I said, it's going to uh, iteratively call the render two times and three times and four times and five times. Uh, well, the, iter the itemized actually has all the patterns it needs in its list, so it's going to go ahead. It, it too also has to restore the original value, apply the first pattern, collect the results, restore the original value, apply the second pattern, collect the results, and so on. And then here's append a literal. Uh, if you if you have your, say you have a list of 100 numbers now, you want to apply three to it. You're going to have to go through all 100 numbers and apply it to the end of all 100. And again, like the same thing with, like, with the patterns. If you're going to do multiple patterns, you've got to take the original list again and pen, pen that on there. So your list gets longer and longer and longer, but you've got to do these operations to all the numbers that you've done previously. Which again, which I said, is like this thing turned out to be a bit more complicated than I originally thought it would be. So as, the, as your list gets bigger and bigger, you have to keep making sure you do those operations on the ever-increasing size list. So if it's a random operation, then if uh, you're just going to pick one of those items in there, then render it and push it into the list. If your list happens to, or happens to be empty, so if this is the very first pattern you're rendering, uh, it's going to, the random wants to, wants to iterate on all the items in the original list. Well, if your original list is empty, it's not going to itemize anything or iterate anything, so you have nothing. So if the list is empty to start with, you just got to push those numbers into the list, and that's what gets you started. Okay, repeat same was interesting. Just had to find the last digit in the string. So first, first for a digit, make sure that there's zero or more non-digits at the end, and then that's the one I'm going to repeat. And then the uh, repeat other is very similar. Find the last digit. And this is kind of brute force, but here's a string of 10 digits. I'm going to remove the one that I found, and then I'm going to pick one of those at random and then put that into the string. Okay. That looks so ugly. There's got to be like a simpler way to do that, but I didn't think, I haven't thought of one yet. And then symbol's real easy. You just get the symbol. The symbol already has a compiled value, so you just got to change your operation. It's the operation right now. The opcode comes from the operation, so I just change the operation to point to whatever that symbol returns. And then I get to use redo. I love it when I can use redo. It's kind of fun as opposed to last. I like, I like the, the comment in the, the camel book about redo is when you want to fake your code into thinking that it, that it didn't do what you just did or whatever, or something like that. It was a very clever comment. So every time I do a redo, I, it makes me think of that comment that's in the camel book about redo, about faking yourself out, about what you just did. This, of course, should never happen. So if you get an unknown operator, then you just return an error. Get symbols just returns a copy of the hash table of the uncompiled symbols. I thought it'd be safer to return a copy of the, the table rather than the table itself so that somebody can't accidentally muck it up. And then here's the, uh, oops, nope, this is supposed to be syntax error. This was interesting here. So you pass in the pattern that you've parsed so far, your message and then an offset. So this little string here returned the caret 
Oh, I should show you a syntax error so you can see how that works. That's right. So if we uh, start this up, say we do i equals uh, 2, 3, and then uh, ampersand 4, 5, 6, then we get syntax error and it points at the ampersand. Can you see that? Okay, yeah, we can do some more complicated things. So if we say i equals, uh, say, 1, 2, 3, and then a pattern, say left pattern, and then we'll do, actually, here, let's do this. Let's do the code, 1, 2, 3, and then 4, 5, 6, and then 7, 8 should be an error because you're not allowed to have, they all have to be the same length. So it should point to the 7, 8. Hey, the 7, 8 needs to be a three-character number, not, uh, not a two-character <coughs> number. And then it gets, even, it gets even nastier when you use the parents because then now you're going into your sub, your recursion there, so now you have a couple of different strings you've got to figure it out with. So if we do a pattern, say, uh, one, two, three, five, six, seven. I'll put, uh, say, the ampersand in there, too, and then something else, and then an X, I don't know. So actually pointed at the ampersand. So between this, printing it out, so it's so a syntax error at, this here is 17 characters long, syntax error at space. That's where this plus 17 comes from. <laughs> and uh, so then you say if, okay, if the message is okay, so I, I made the I made the message optional. So in this case, I have a message defined. So then you're going to go ahead and put the dash message in there. Then a re, then a new line. So you're going to add spaces in. You're going to add 17 spaces in to get you back over here again. And then you got the position that it's currently at in this. Then minus or add whatever offset they pass in. Okay, and then there's your caret. Of course, so this is the bulk of the work, but then again, to make this work right, when you're compiling it, you had to calculate the correct the correct uh, offset. So for instance, in the code, if I said the width of the code, yeah, I'm fixing my typos here. Okay, where was that about the code length being wrong? Okay, it's one of these. So here I'm parsing out, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's one of these. I've got a digit string here, so if it's not equal to the width of the very first one, then syntax error and correct code length, and then it was, let's see. Okay, the sub pattern is going to be everything. Okay, the sub pattern is what I'm parsing, so it's going to be everything except for the angle brackets. So it's the length of that whole string. We're going to back up by the position that we've currently we've parsed up to, and then plus one to make everything work out right, negate that. That's our offset, and then we get magically get the little pointer point at the right spot. So that's pretty pretty nice because with that position, because in the past before I knew about the position and all that kind of stuff, it was a real chore to try to get those carrots, those pointers come out at the right spot. Anyway, that's a whirlwind tour through this. Are there any more questions? And I'll have all this code and and the powerpoints and all that up on the website when uh, this gets up on YouTube. So, okay, well, thank you very much for putting up with me. Thank you. <laughs>